This is episode 4 of Jonah chapter 3, Kings and Prophets. So Jonah was, here's Jonah over here, he was a contemporary of Amos and Hosea. They were all preaching to the northern kingdom. And then Jonah was asked to also go to Nineveh and preach to them. So the Assyrian Empire was the enemy of the northern kingdom and Israel's greatest threat. Jonah was tasked with warning Nineveh, their capital city, of their wickedness. So all of these were preaching, and Elijah and Elisha were also here under Ahab preaching to the north. So God sent a lot of prophets to warn them. Brief history, Jonah lived in the town of gath Hefer within the tribal land of Zebulun. So here's Zebulun up here. It was quite a hike from Zebulun down to Joppa. So you can see that instead of going to Nineveh, Jonah was intending to head south. He had no intention of going north. He was heading south. And Jaffa here is the, the other name for Joppa, and it's where Tel Aviv, modern, modern Tel Aviv is. So Jonah was not the first prophet to preach to the northern kingdom, plus Nineveh. He was preceded by the prophets Elijah and Elisha, and their ministry is recorded in the books of one and two kings. So they weren't what they call writing prophets. They were part of one and two kings, the books of one and two kings in the Bible. Uh, they didn't have their separate uh, books like the others did. So these two were also called to minister to Gentile nations, specifically Phoenicia, which is this land of Asher here, and Aram, the Assyrians. So prophets, God didn't keep his prophets just for his own, uh, the Jews and the Hebrews. He, he sent them out to other nations. He warned the Edomites and the Moabites and the Ammonites. So they were all warned when God had their evil, as he said, came up before them and he, he would warn them before he took them out if they didn't repent. So Jonah was a contemporary of the two prophets, Amos and Hosea. So God was giving the northern kingdom fair warning of their impending judgment at the hands of the Assyrians if they didn't repent and clean up their act. Christ himself referred to these four Old Testament prophets, Elijah, Elisha, Isaiah, and Jonah. Thus Jesus authenticated all four men. So this was basically the known world at the time. And here's Nineveh is in this direction. And here's Joppa and Jonah was heading outside of even the known world. He was heading west, boy. Go west, young man. So episode four, the layout of Jonah illustrates the key theme, which is the relentless love of God. Chapter one, Jonah was disobedient, but God was patient. Chapter two, God answers Jonah's prayer, and God has mercy towards him. Chapter three, which is where we are now, Jonah preaches to Nineveh and God's power through Jonah. And the people of Nineveh believe and they repent. And chapter 4 next is Jonah's displeasure and God's ministry to Jonah as God teaches Jonah yet another lesson. So let's get into chapter 3, Jonah in Nineveh. Jonah preaches in Nineveh his undeserved commission. I mean, he really didn't deserve God's mercy, but he got it. Throughout Jonah's time of rebellion, God was displeased with his prophet. In fact, after Jonah's stubborn disobedience, it's a wonder God spoke to him at all. But God never deserted him. God controlled the storm, prepared the fish, and rescued Jonah from the deep in accordance with his word. Hebrews 13, for he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Isaiah 43, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. God, in his grace, forgave Jonah and restored him to his divine calling, to his prophetic ministry. But first he had to learn a tough lesson. In fact, he died for his rebellion. The lesson of Jonah is that the will of God will never lead you where the grace of God can't keep you and the power of God can't use you. God's a good God. Verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, so a second time, Jonah did not obey God the first time, but now that he has Jonah's undivided attention, God patiently repeats himself. Remember, Jonah inside the fish had repented of running away. So when he cried out to God for mercy and was saved, he thought, now I'll go back to the temple and worship again. He did not think, now that I'm saved, I'll go to Nineveh as God originally commanded me to do. No, God had to tell him here a second time. Praise God that we serve a God that gives us second chances. In my case, God granted me dozens of chances. I made a list once of the six times that I've been face-to-face -face with certain death. 
And I even thought to myself as I watched its death approaching, this time I'm dead. Yet by some miracle and God's grace, my life was spared. I think it was because all those times I was still a sinner and God remembered my mother's prayers. She prayed for all of us kids every morning and every night for decades. So God intervened and allowed me to live. I'm so grateful for his mercy. Imagine if I had died and was sitting in Hades right now, waiting for judgment day. No hope. Instead, I'm saved and can look forward to glory. Forgiveness doesn't mean we've been let off the hook. It just means God has forgiven our sins because we sincerely repented. But if we can, we should still try to correct the wrong that we did, undo the sin we committed. Some sins can't be undone like murder, rape, and incest and adultery. But many can be undone by asking forgiveness of the victim, even here. And theft can be undone. Proverbs 6 in Amplified Version says, And when he, the thief, is found, he must repay seven times what he stole. He must give all the property of his house, if necessary, to meet his fine. Sell everything he has to repay seven times. Or work it off, repay his theft with his free labor. I have found in my life that most importantly, we have to forgive ourselves so that we can heal and move forward and onward. That's my toughest one, is to forgive myself. Verse 2, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. Arise, go. Jonah knew he was on a mission for God, but for all he knew, the people would reject his message and impale him on a pole or skin him alive. But it's a testament to his lesson in obedience that he now obeyed God no matter what. To Nineveh, that great city. According to Genesis 10, four cities were included in the Nineveh metroplex. Nineveh, Rehoboth, Ur, Kalah, and Resin. Nineveh, the capital of the city of Assyrian Empire, lay on the eastern banks of the Tigris. We know two things about Nineveh. It was a great city, and it was a wicked city. It was an affluent city with wealthy citizens luxuriating in sin and vice, and Jonah hated them. So here's Genesis 10, talking about Nineveh to the east of the Tigris River. Here's the Tigris. So Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. Remember the Tower of Babel? That was Nimrod was the king there telling everybody to worship him. And Erech Enakad, and Kalneh in the land of Shinar. Out of that land of Shinar went forth Asher and builded Nineveh and the city Rehoboth and Kalah, and resin between Nineveh and Kalah, the same is a great city. So it was a huge area, Nineveh. And Jonah hated them. Compare Jonah to the apostle Peter when he was in a house in Joppa. God called him to go to a Roman Gentile and preach as opposed to an Assyrian. The Romans oppressed Judea, had fought them and overcome them, and their wars caused great distress and hardship to the Jews. The, the Romans loved a crucifixion, just like the Assyrians did. And like Jonah, Peter had no love for the Romans. Yet God ordered him to go to the home of the centurion named Cornelius, and Peter immediately obeyed. You can read about it in Acts 10. And ultimately, all Gentiles in the world found salvation through Peter's initial obedience, and then Paul's journeys, etc., and the apostles spread the word to the, to the Gentiles. But it was thanks to Peter that God said, look, Gentiles are not unclean. When I tell you to go someplace, you go. So Nineveh, that great city. In Revelation, Jerusalem was called that great city. Yet here God calls Nineveh that great city. Why? Because God has a great plan for the city. God wants to bring salvation for two million people. Up until this moment, Jonah only thinks that he knows what God is going to say. In chapter 1, God said to Jonah, go to Nineveh and speak what I tell you to speak. And Jonah thought, this message is going to be about a merciful God. Because Jonah hated those people, he figured, I want nothing to do with this nation. So preach to it the message that I tell you. A prophet's a bearer of a message from God, not simply a foreteller of coming events. Now look at this city that I found on this website. It's absolutely huge, the walls and all these towers that it has. I mean, magnificent city. And on this side, all the cultivation of the plants. And it was known for its gorgeous gardens and public parks. So an unparalleled awakening. Verse 3. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. 
Now, Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey in extent. So Jonah wrote, so by three days, what they say, what they mean is when you walk the walls around the city, if you start at the main gate and walk all the way around and all the way back to the main gate, it's going to take three days. It was a huge city. So, so Jonah arose. Jonah had learned his lesson, but reluctantly. He still would prefer the Nineveh to be destroyed. Yet Nineveh had great potential and God wanted to use them for his purposes. While this city did not have a covenant relationship with God, Nevertheless, since God is the creator of all, he wanted to bring them into a covenant relationship. And went to Nineveh exceedingly great city. Nineveh stood by both outer and inner walls that sported 1,500 towers, all these towers, to guard the city, each tower being 200 feet high. The inner wall was over 50 foot wide. That's like a five-story building on its side and over 100 feet high, 10 stories high. Three chariots could race abreast on the wall. It took a million four hundred slaves to build these battlements and took eight years. Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, and a Google search claims the population was around 120,000. But chapter 4 implies it was more like one to two million souls. Because Jonah 4 says, God says to Jonah, And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city, in which are more than 120,000 persons, who cannot discern between their right hand and their left, and much livestock. So if you don't know right from wrong, the implication is you're still a child, learning these righteous basics. With a family of minimum 46 children plus parents, the population of Nineveh would be between three quarters of a million and a million, plus another million in slaves to maintain the great parks and public gardens, build aqueducts and irrigation ditches, repair the battlements, work the fields, and care for the enormous herds of livestock in the surrounding countryside. So overall, Nineveh likely catered for nearly 2 million souls and was at the height of its extraordinary grandeur and glory and had enormous influence. The stability of the city encouraged the development of the arts, sciences, and architectural innovations. Here's an Iraqi family. So the famous hanging gardens were wrongly attributed to Babylon. Architectural diggings can find no proof at all that Babylon had the hanging gardens because, in fact, they were actually the hanging gardens of Nineveh. The city's hanging gardens were one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And there's lots, uh, I saw a documentary about 20 years ago of this woman that goes to Iraq and follows the canals down from the mountains down into Nineveh and proves that it was the hanging gardens were of Nineveh, not Babylon. So a three-day journey in extent. The city was 60 miles in con circumference. It took three days to walk the city from end to end. The number three symbolizes revealing something. God wanted to reveal himself to all the inhabitants of the city. Verse 4. And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. Then he cried out and said, Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. On the first day's walk, the number one relates to God. God wanted to reveal to this city his nature, his character, and his purposes. He cried out and said, Jonah's message was not one of grace, nor of forgiveness. It was a message about the character of God, specifically his holiness. In chapter 1 we read that God said their wickedness had risen up before him and he was ready to judge it. God said the city would be overthrown or destroyed for the evil. Nineveh is not in Israel. The city had nothing to do with the Hebrews except as their greatest enemy. And here, if you had enough money, you could have a bracelet or a plaque made of just how vicious you were. Here's a, a, here's a prisoner. They've chopped off his feet and chopped off his hands. You can see them floating here. They chopped off their heads and impaled them on, on poles and on walls of their building. An unbelievably brutal bunch of people. Um, you, could, you could make a bracelet out of it if you wanted to. So they were, Nineveh was Israel's greatest enemy. So why was Jonah sent to preach to create? And because they were sinners, therefore they were subject to the righteousness and judgment of God. In a time of wartime viciousness, Nineveh stood out as the worst offender with the most brutal atrocities. For amusement, they tortured people to death. And then they bragged about their depravity and carved their wickedness into walls for all to see. The city itself, beautiful as it was, was nevertheless so violent that even their king commented on their extreme criminal behavior. 
They were also pagans and infamous for their idolatry, with temples dedicated to their gods, especially their primary god, Dagon, the fish god. Since Jonah was swallowed by a great fish, this would certainly have grabbed the attention of the Ninevites. The symbol of the fish god was prevalent back then and endures even till today within occult groups. So here's the priest of ancient Dagon, the worship, and then they had this fish sort of hat that they wore, and they worshipped the fish. And then today we have this fish kind of hat that's been worn as well within occult groups. Yet 40 days. So the number 40 has to do with change. 40 days in the Bible is a testing time, a probationary period. There are multiple examples of this. The flood, it rained for 40 days. Moses on the mountain when he's talking to God and he gets the Ten Commandments, he's up there for 40 days. The Jewish spies, they explored Canaan for 40 days before coming back to Moses and saying, yike, we look like grasshoppers, we're so small next to them. Elijah's flight to Horeb, the mountain of God, where uh, with Jezebel in hot pursuit. So the prophet Elijah ran away for 40 days. He's, well, he stayed in the cave for 40 days. Goliath taunted the Israelites for 40 days before David came along and said, who's this unclean Philistine, uncircumcised Philistine that's bugging you guys? And the temptation, Christ fasted in the wilderness for 40 days. And then over here, you've got 40 days and then you're toast. So Jonah doesn't preach a ministry of repentance, not at all. He didn't want to warn them in the first place. So his ministry is, you've got 40 days is all, then you're toast. Now, why would God send Jonah to this vast city if there was no hope for them at all? Because God did give them 40 days grace to turn from their wicked ways. So he did warn them. So the people of Nineveh believed. Verse 5. So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. People of Nineveh. News travels fast. So by the time Jonah reached Nineveh, probably everyone in the city knew that Jonah got vomited out by a fish onto dry land. So before Jonah even got to Nineveh, his presence was regarded as a divine sign to the Ninevites because they worshipped Dagon, the fish god. And Jonah, when he preached, they listened. In addition to plagues that erupted there in 765 and 759 BC, so the Ninevites were ready to believe that their gods were also displeased with them. The word plague occurs around 100 times in the Bible. So this was a, the plagues were a, taken as a sign that the gods were mad at people in, in biblical times. Then a total eclipse of the sun occurred on June in 763 BC, the memory of which further enhanced the message of the reluctant prophet Jonah. These national troubles were considered signs of divine origin and anger. So the people were conditioned to respond rapidly to Jonah's message of doom. In fact, we don't read anywhere that Jonah preached repentance of any kind. Jonah probably would have preferred that they didn't repent and God would then wipe them out. Jonah was a Hebrew who hated the Assyrians, and the Assyrians hated the Hebrews just as much. And here is this prophet of God walking all alone in their vast city and delivering a judgment message straight from his God. They could have killed Jonah and said to themselves, let's see what his God does now. But they didn't. Only a foreigner who really knew God would march into their city, known for wickedness and vicious criminality, and condemn them to their faces. Yet, however reluctantly, Jonah must have preached to them and not just the eight words, 40 days and you're toast. Well, 40 days and none of us shall be overthrown. In the Hebrew text, it's only five words. I'm sure that people must have asked, what can we do? How can we avert this catastrophe? So Jonah must have explained that God is merciful and just and eager to forgive them their sins. But we don't know. What we do know is Jonah went to Nineveh and God did the rest. Believed God. They believed God. The book says they believed God, not that they believed Jonah. They accepted that Jonah's warning was from God and acted accordingly. They responded to a holy God that judges evil. And they had a healthy fear of angering the divine. So the people of Nineveh repented wholeheartedly with fasting and sackcloth from the king on down to the lowliest person. Historically, this had never happened before on this scale. An enormous city rapidly and totally repented. Two million people literally dropped to their knees. Today, we don't fear the Lord our God enough. Nineveh was a city of people living in the lap of luxury 
eating a vast array of fruits and delicacies. God gave the city 40 days, but they didn't need that long. They immediately fasted. They took off their gorgeous clothes and put on sackcloth. They had a healthy fear of God. Today we don't have this fear of God. Matthew 12, Jesus says, The men of Nineveh will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. So Jesus is the greater than Jonah. He's here, he's preaching to them, and they're not repenting. In, in, his, in Jesus' day, they weren't repenting. He was saying, the men of Nineveh are going to rise up against you guys because they repented, but you guys aren't repenting. So Nineveh repented when they heard Jonah, yet the people of Judea did not repent when they heard Jesus. What an indictment of the Jews at the time. And still today, most Jews do not accept Jesus as their Messiah. And billions of Gentiles don't accept Christ as their Savior either. The entire globe is in a sad state of sin and worldliness. Proclaimed a fast. From a biblical perspective, this means self-denial means not just going without food and drink. It means em emptying yourself of your hopes, your dreams, your plans, your lifestyle, and waiting to listen to God. And that's what the Ninevites did. Like the sailors in the storm, the Ninevites knew they had to change, so they did. They had no formal reassurance that they would be saved, but they hoped that the God that Jonah preached would have compassion on them and relent and spare the city. And don't forget, back in the day, the Jews, the Hebrews were always known for having just one God. Every other nation had thousands of gods or hundreds of gods and goddesses. But the Hebrews were known for having just one God. And so they're hoping that the God that Jonah preached would have compassion and relent. Put on sackcloth. This was a customary sign of humbling oneself in repentance. Sackcloth is a rough, itchy cloth, usually made with goat or camel hair. It's not unlike a hessian bag of today used for carrying things like vegetables. This was a wealthy city and its citizens likely wore silk and soft linens. But now the fear of the Lord caused them to toss aside their luxury clothes and put on sackcloth. Sackcloth was worn as a sign of their mourning and penitence. It signified repentance. This attitude of repentance began with the common people and moved up the social scale, from the greatest to the least of them. This was no respecter of persons. From the highest officials in the land to the lowliest slaves, everyone repented. Verse 6. Then word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and laid aside his robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. The king of Nineveh. So this king was not just the king of Nineveh. He was the king of the mighty Assyrian empire the entire empire finally the king hears about the city's repentance then even the king stripped himself of his finery put on sackcloth and covered himself in ashes notice that the king wasn't specifically asked to do that but at that time the king had such a massive unrest in his kingdom was putting down riots left and right now his capital city was in danger so he too decided that he should obey jonah's message just in case Verse 7, and he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by a decree of the king and his nobles, saying that neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water. The king issued a formal edict that all should repent, for this was a matter of life or death for the city, including the livestock, which was highly unusual because it expressed the urgency of the Ninevites and their need for mercy. He declared an extreme national fast. Nobody and no animal was to eat or drink. Nineveh was known for its social injustice, violent crime, and brutal warfare. So they were ripe for divine punishment. This king was taking Jonah's message very seriously. Of course, Jonah must have looked very strange. His skin was likely bleached pure white. He had no hair anywhere on his body, per the James Bartley story. And his fish had spat him out, and they believed in the fish god. Verse 8, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. This king was covering all his bases. Just in case an animal was to blame for the city's coming destruction, everybody and everything had to repent in sackcloth. 
And the people did repent, not because the king told them to, but because they really were fearfully convicted. Where is any national leader today calling their nation or even a city to repentance? Nowhere in the world will you find that today. There isn't one. So let everyone turn from his evil way. In addition to sackcloth, ashes and fasting, everybody had to turn from their evil ways. This was likely a tougher assignment for Ninevites because the king himself was recorded as saying his people were especially evil. At the time, the power of the king himself was being threatened due to the emergence of extraordinarily powerful officials whom, while they accepted the authority of the Assyrian monarch in practice, acted with supreme authority themselves and began to issue their own inscriptions similar to those of the king. Such inscriptions by officials were more common at this time than inscriptions from the kings themselves, according to Wikipedia. So at the time, the king faced a turbulent period of unrest, both by his subjects within his kingdom and from riots and rebellion by vassal cities and states. It was a very unstable time, and the king was disposed to take Jonah at his word that they had just 40 days to zap time. And of course, the recent huge solar eclipse that coincided with all this earlier helped to instill the desired fear of divine chastisement. Notice that nations are judged now while individuals are judged when Jesus returns. It's interesting that nations are immediately judged. Proverbs 14, righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. So verse 9, who can tell if God will turn and relent, says the king, and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not per perish? So this pagan king likely read his horoscope before doing anything. He practiced the occult. He bowed to idols. He conversed with his magicians. And he believed his destiny was foreordained in the stars. Now this same pagan king declared a national time of repentance in the hopes that Jonah's God would relent. This king worships Dagon, the fish god, and here is Jonah come out of a fish. So the king's willing to try repentance. Who can tell? Who knows? Let's try repentance. We have nothing to lose, everything to gain. So the king knew, or at least believed, that Jonah's god was a merciful god. Notice the contrast here between Assyria, the pagan nation, and Israel, the northern kingdom. Nineveh was a city of pagans. Jonah was a stranger. Yet they all repented. Thus they were spared God's wrath. Israel claimed to be God's people. They ignored their own prophets, Amos, Jonah, Hosea, Elijah, and Elisha. They didn't repent. Thus they went into exile in Assyria for their apostasy. Amazing. The Ninevites, Ninevites the pagans repented, but God's people didn't. Verse 10. Then God saw their works in Nineveh, that they turned from their evil way, and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. And God relented. God often responds with mercy to man's repentance. Certainly, he's been merciful to me by canceling his threatened punishment. God pitied this great city that was genuinely repenting, so he spared them his wrath. Our God of justice and mercy didn't relent, because the city was two million people. He didn't relent because Nineveh was a great city. He relented because the people repented. They didn't just have a different attitude. They also had vastly different behavior. They turned from their wicked ways, and God relented. Jeremiah 18, God says, The instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up, to pull down, and to destroy it, if that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disasters that I thought to bring upon it. He did not do it. The city was only 40 days from ground zero, but their abject wholehearted repentance saved them. They didn't even know the Hebrew God or the scriptures, but like the sailors, they had an expectation of mercy. And God gave them another hundred years before they slid back into their old ways and were taken out. Let's hope God gives America another hundred years if we can have just national repentance. Nineveh was so badly destroyed by the Medes and Persians after their hundred years 
and they slipped back into idolatry, um, that Nineveh ceased to exist. It ceased to exist. In fact, when Alexander the Great arrived, he didn't know that he was walking over a city. It was so obliterated. It was just a sand wasteland. They're digging it out of the sea. Archaeologists now are digging it out of the sand. Can you imagine that Alexander the Great walked over that and didn't even know there was a city beneath his feet? So the miracles of repentance. So we, there's ten miracles altogether. We've done the first chapter one and two where he has the storm, where he's in the fish. And now the seventh miracle is the repentance of the entire city of Nineveh. But altogether, there's actually a few if you break that up into Jonah's repentance. He has a change of attitude. Jonah's obedience, where he goes and preaches to Nineveh. The entire city repents, which is this number seven. Even the king repents. And God repented or relented of his wrath of judgment and didn't do it. So this one here, people, you could split it up into a few. So where are we in America? Are we undercover Christians? Does the world know that we are a Christian nation? Astonishingly, the body of Christ, the church, is as guilty of some of the awful sins as anyone in the world. Dr. Chuck Mister says facetiously, if some Christians were put on trial for their faith, there isn't enough evidence to convict them. Isn't that sad? Let's hope that we all experience a national repentance and be granted another hundred years like Nineveh. 2 Chronicles 7, God announces his principle to Solomon, the principle that he stands on. He tells Solomon about it. He says, if my people, which today is the church, back in the day of Solomon, he's talking to Solomon there. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. So it's not good enough just to humble yourself on Sunday and Monday to Saturday, you back at the bad stuff. And it's not good enough to just pray occasionally. You go to church, you humble yourself, you pray. You have to seek his face. You have to create a relationship with God. Seek his face. And, not, and then also turn from your wicked ways. As, God, as Jesus said to the woman, the adulteress, go and sin no more. So if you can do these four things, then God will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. So Robert Bork says in his book, Slouching Towards Gomorrah, which I think is a fabulous title, Slouching Towards Gomorrah. Robert says, the only hope for America is a grassroots revival. So Nineveh repented and all's well. So why didn't this book end with chapter 3? Because God's objective for Nineveh and for us has not yet been accomplished. We'll see more in chapter 4. So Alexander Tyler in 1750, 300 years ago nearly, said the cycle of nations from bondage to spiritual faith. So this is the cycle. From bondage to spiritual faith. So imagine this is Europe and the, the, the uh, early Americans are in bondage there. They can't uh, worship freely. Uh, they have their spiritual faith that they want to do. From, uh, so the spiritual faith to great courage. So they had great courage and they got in the Mayflower and they said, we're going off to a new country, we're going to new land, we're going to uh, worship the way we want to. So they had great courage, which gave them liberty. And they fought for it to the point where they now had stable, uh, they were stable and they had abundance and everyone was living a good life, which then makes people complacent and people don't watch what their leaders are doing and what's happening in government. And if there's any corruption or anything like that, and who's stealing it. Because mankind has not changed in the 6,000 years since the Garden of Eden. So after too much abundance, we get very complacent. And then it becomes, we become apathetic because the, the rich, are, rich are fabulously wealthy and everybody else is just struggling to pay their food bill. They're being taxed out of existence. And they get apathetic. They think, well, what can I do? I'm just one person. So then they, the government says, oh, don't worry, we'll make slaves of you and we'll, you can become independent of ours. We'll give you, you know, we'll help you buy your food, help you pay your rent, etc. And that leads again to bondage. So if we look at the scale of in America, where on this circle do you think we are on this cycle of nations? Dependency back into bondage. So a reminder, the book of Jonah is not simply about a great fish, mentioned only four times or a great city named for nine times, or even a disobedient prophet mentioned 18 times. 
It's about God. It's about the love and mercy of God. God is mentioned 38 times in this short book. And if you eliminate him, the story doesn't make sense. The book of Jonah is about the will of God and how we respond to it. So this is the end of chapter 3. Jonah preaches to Nineveh and God is a faithful God. 1 John 1, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He is faithful and just. He is the faithful God who keeps his covenant for a thousand generations. Deuteronomy 7, 9. So my word says God that proceeds from my mouth will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish what I please and it will prosper where I send it. Isaiah 55, 11. Praise God. So before you go, let me bless you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Number six. God bless you. Thank you. Follow me to chapter four, episode five. God bless you. God bless you. And shalom.